Okay, we've uh, arrived at the, uh, the question and answer session. Since this event was advertised as, a, as an open forum, uh, I'm going to allow um, comments and questions. Um, but just a reminder, in order to be fair to everyone, questions should not uh, go on longer than a minute, minute and a half. If it goes on beyond that, then in the best tradition of Middle Eastern authoritarianism, I will cut you off. <laughs> so um, the floor is open. Um, there's enough material, three excellent presentations, and I turn it over to you. Yeah, question. Um, so obviously there's been a lot of comparison between what's happening in Egypt right now and the Islamic revolution in Iran and Iran. So my question for you is, what differences or similarities do you see between the two? And do you see um, a Muslim theocracy um, taking over in Egypt, given the role El Brady and the Muslim Brotherhood um, have? And what do you think this would mean for the future of the region? Okay. Joe, you want to you want to take that? Yeah, I'll um, we'll give you other two chances as well. Yeah. Um, the the first difference is that there's no Khomeini uh, in in Egypt. You you don't have a charismatic leader like Khomeini. Um, who has been uh, mobilizing um, the uh, Islamic elements. In the, in the Iranian case, it was the ulama, of course. Um, but again, um, I, for one, don't know enough about the inner workings of the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't know to what extent such a leader might or, 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 or might not emerge. I find the parallels to be very, very instructive. If I may quote, quote Mao again, um, in, in 1949, when he established the Chinese Republic, he said, the Chinese people have stood up. Right? Well, they did stand up, but um, they got knocked down quite badly uh, uh, afterwards. Um, and a similar thing happened in Iran. The Iranian people stood up, and look what happened. So the parallels are not exact, but certainly it seems to me that we do have cause for concern. The basic issue that the US faces is very simple. On the one hand, you've got security. On the other hand, you've got human rights and development. What kind of balance do you strike? when you want to achieve both of those goals. Right? Rob suggested, and perhaps rightly so, that uh, we place too much weight on security. Yeah. Perhaps. But, but uh, again, the question is, what balance do we strike? One of the major differences between the Iranian revolution and what's going on in Egypt is that in the Iranian revolution, issues of identity were very important. And what's going on in Egypt at the moment, it's not about identity. You know, this is a major difference. In addition to what Professor Shilowitz mentioned about like the absence of a charismatic leader like Khomeini. The Muslim Brotherhood is really facing a major crisis. I would dare to say that the 90s were the decade of the Islamists in the Arab world. You, but it wasn't even in the 90s, it wasn't even the Muslim Brotherhood. In the case of Egypt, you had Islamic Jihad and Jama'a Islamiyya. In the case of Algeria, you had the Fis and the Jia. They were not Mahfouz al Nahnah, who was the, the head of the Muslim Brotherhood branch. What The Muslim Brotherhood also is not a monolithic whole. There are different factions within the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, during last elections, parliamentary elections that happened a couple of months ago, a number of leading figures from the middle generation of the Muslim Brotherhood called upon their leadership to boycott the elections. It was, they issued a public statement asking the leadership to boycott the elections. The leadership didn't listen to it and participated in the elections. So the Muslim Brotherhood is not this really boogeyman. They're not that, you know, they're really not that powerful. Even their own leaders say that they only represent 20% of the population max. Max. This is the support that they can mobilize. Given that the other groups don't have a space to work, 
and to mobilize. But if other groups are given, other political currents are given a chance to participate in an open forum, I believe that they will even gain, that the Muslim Brotherhood would get less than 20% of any vote. But at the end of the day, if the people choose the Muslim Brotherhood, I think it's their right. As long as there are guarantees that it will not be the first and only elections. Comment on the previous question, since I study this area. Uh, the question about parallels between 1979 and today, and political, uh, comparing political Islam in Egypt with Iran in 79, presupposes that all political Islamist movements are exactly the same. It also presupposes that we are still in the 1979 moment, that there hasn't been ideological transformation and change within political Islamist circles, including in, in, in Egypt. And I think the other missing ingredient is really, I think, much more central here, and that is Turkey. The model that at least you're hearing rhetorically from the Muslim Brothers is the AK party is the model that they're aspiring to, not the models in Iran. And so the model of successful political Islam in Turkey is one that has really shaped the politics of political Islam, not only in Egypt, but in Tunisia, and is a, an important variable that has to be included in the, in the, in the equation in trying to make these, I think, comparisons. To, um, the mindset of, of people who are not necessarily out on the streets in Egypt. Um, I was watching Al Jazeera English's coverage of Mubarak's speech, and directly after that, they were obviously covering what was happening in Tahrir Square and, and all over the country. Um, and there was a lot of cries of, you know, get out, and people obviously very, very upset and saying that this was not enough. Um, but they started interviewing a protester who was just a random person they had picked out of the crowd, um, who was saying that he um, had listened to the speech and that it was a clear reaction from the people in the crowd. Um, but he was guessing that at most, maybe one to two million people were in the streets um, in any given city in Egypt. And there were another 70 million that were at home watching that speech on TV and watching the reaction as well. Uh, and he wondered aloud, which I thought was very interesting, um, if he, he thought that the 70 million who were at home had probably had uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of concern and were, were probably very sympathetic to what was going on out in the streets and, and were probably siding with the protesters. But he wondered if after that speech, some of the reaction from the households would have been well, he's given us concessions. These are real things. We should stop protesting. This is enough. I called a friend of mine in uh, Egypt to just to check on him, see how he was doing. And he told me that, like, uh, just like to give you kind of an idea about like uh, the kind of pro Mubarak demonstrators who were in Tahrir yesterday, said until now, 750 people anti-Mubarak demonstrators got hurt and injured. This is the first toll and the first uh, result of this counter-attack that Mubarak has launched. When it comes to what people think, uh, he also told me that many people from the middle class decided to stay home after this speech. And they were saying that what more do you want? He already made these concessions. So there is a split now. There's a major split which was also reflected in the email that I uh, like read uh, parts of it uh, to you guys earlier. So I think this is what he's trying to do. He's trying to split the opposition. He's giving something to the middle class by saying, okay, I'm going out, so you're gonna have your kids or you guys might have like an opportunity to get some share in power. But he's not offering anything to the middle, the middle and lower uh, strata of the middle class or to the lower classes and the working class. And those are the ones who are still on the streets. But it's still too early to tell. Also you need to keep in mind that many people are staying home because they feel that it's safer there, that they need to stay there to protect their property and their families. Mm -hmm. Because with all these like thugs on the streets, you know, breaking into homes, people are afraid. So this is the tactics that Mubarak is following.